you guys going to be uh, you know us by now. And, uh, Tom. So um, we'll get right back right into it. Uh, we're going to go over uh, Tom's presentation here on production and practices and uh, we'll take it away, Tom. Yeah, part three, uh, practical and technical considerations uh, for bringing our graphic apparel designs to the production floor. Um, starting with testing, um, this is a very, very critical uh, initial step to bringing our design to reality. Um, but before we go to in-house testing, I like to focus on uh, manufacturer uh, and distributor resources available to us because a lot of these guys um, have uh, uh, done extensive testing on their products. Um, if we go to the next slide here, you can see an example, uh, Bella Canvas, um, great uh, manufacturer of apparel products. They have available on their site um, fabric and ink compatibility results for almost their entire line of fabrics, uh, recommended decoration techniques per fabric, and then, of course, detailed uh, product specs on their entire uh, extensive product line. Uh, another example would be Sandmar. Uh, again, they have detailed product specs. So e even though you know they're selling uh, a lot of products that they don't actually manufacture themselves, they've gone through the effort of doing their own um, product specifications. They have uh, an, a, a very, very robust media library where they have um, beautiful flat images and lifestyle images um, of all of the products that they sell. And add to that, they've actually created a, um, a decorator solutions team. So it's an entire team at Sanmar that is dedicated to um, providing resources to decorators. So if you have questions um, or concerns or issues with any of the products that they're selling, they have a whole team of people that can, uh, can provide uh, answers to any of your questions. Um, so I always like to start with the, you know, with the manufacturers and the distributors uh, prior to even going into our own product testing. Uh, another resource um, would be Poly One. So uh, actually, may, maybe Ray, you can talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I use the technical bulletins, um, uh, you know, follow the rec recommended parameters for decoration and um, extensive tips and techniques. But maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what you guys do at Poly One for, for printers. Well, we uh, obviously we, we create these PIBs and technical sheets uh, based on our own printing at, the, at our plants um, and we go this from the very beginning when we first developing the product. So we know it very well by the time it's released. Uh, one thing that gets me about social media sometimes is somebody will just send a blanket question out on some of these chat rooms and get a lot of different answers. I would always say first, you know, look up the PIB for that, that product. Uh, you know, for instance, it may say, uh, will flex quick white, just Google that and you'll see a PIB show up somewhere. You just click on it or, Rutland Street Fighter or Union, you know, mix opaque. Usually there's something will pop up on your feed and it has all the information you need right there to get started. If you have a question after that, uh, obviously we have a team ready to either talk to you on the phone, uh, text with you, or even show up at your plant. And you mentioned some of these resources, uh, the, the shirts, the, the Bella and Sanmar. I know for a fact that uh, They've used, I mean, I actually did some printing for them when they were kind of developing some of these sheets. Uh, and they, they use quite a few different ink manufacturers to kind of make a, a good solid um, uh, product information uh, printing, you know, printing for their shirts. Uh, so they got a good solid you know, results and, uh, and recommendations. Yeah, um, Samar does a, a great job of, of you know doing a lot of this this work themselves, but then they also rely on um, on their network of of printers. We've done a lot of testing for Samar over the years, as we have with Bella Canvas um, um, to test new products as they're as they're being developed. Um, so a great resources right there between Bella Canvas, Sanmar, and Poly One, and then there are more beyond that. Um, but of course, none of this is, uh, is, uh, substitutes in-house testing. So, um, we would, uh, very, very crucial that we do our own, um, discharge, uh, testing on various products. 
um, using a non-pigmented discharge, of course, to kind of get a true idea. And, and if you see the example there, you can see how three different colors within the same style are going to have different reactions with discharge. So we would use a non-pigmented discharge using the same standard image, a large um, open print area, and then we would grade the results A, B, and C. Um, once you start to do this with various products and you're kind of creating your own library and that's just a check against, you know, whatever, whatever the manufacturers or the distributors are putting out there. And in some, in many cases we're, we're working with products where, you know, the, the testing information is not available from the manufacturer or distributor. So, um, yeah. very, very important to do your own testing. Of course, um, you know, with some, you know, and with discharge ink, um, because it is reactive, you're going to get different results as well based on dye lot. So depending on the project that you're working on, you may want to do testing with every production run of that product because you're working with a different dye lot. Tom, one of the cool things we did at our shop a long time ago is we took all of the different shirts that we offer and we ran discharge just like a little logo, um, like a two inch logo. We ran this discharge on every kind of shirt that we offered. And then we cut them out into little squares and we glue stick them to a piece of cardboard. And we have this ring of pretty much every shirt that you could ever imagine, the color, and then what, how the discharge reacts to it. And that's like the most helpful thing you can do. It's an invaluable tool to the designer, yep. to, um, you know, to your, your uh, production artists, et cetera. Uh, and, and to the salesman, because if they're showing it, trying to set customer expectations in the plant and, yep. They say, hey, why can't you do it on this royal shirt? Well, this is why. So here it is. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, and I also I also like that because some some of these shirts, especially some of these tri-blends, you'd be surprised how some of them come out because yeah, right. the, the dyed fabric in that tri-blend is actually the cotton. Then all of a sudden you have a brighter white on a on a, what seems to be a heather or a, or a tri-blend. So there's, there's shirts out there like that. So it's best to... Do exactly what you were talking about, LT. That is a great tool to have for everybody in the plant. It's just a really hard thing to guess. And I mean, there's so many shirts out there that you could be printing on. And it's just, it, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen unless you just get out there and, and do it. Exactly. If we advance to the next slide, um, another test that we would do is uh, for dye migration. Um, so I call this the poor man's dye migration test. It's uh, basically put a drop of plasticizer um, onto the fabric, um, uh, put a piece of white fabric on top, you heat press it at 320 degrees for 30 seconds, and that's gonna give you a very, very good idea of um, what you're facing in terms of dye migration. You can grade the results again with an ABC grade. Uh, if you see there in the example, we've got on the two images on the left, um, there, the bottom left is a very, very, um, um, difficult situation that you'd be dealing with, with dye migration kind of tells you what type of ink selection you'd have to use, how you're going to negotiate, uh, that product and print top left. You're seeing, um, some evidence of dye migration and then the two images on the right, none whatsoever. And, uh, I, and I knowing, and knowing this information really can change the way you design and what kind of design you're going to put on that garment because you know right away you're going to have to put some kind of uh, blocker down or or a very uh, you know a thicker white you know it's, it's, let's face it uh, low bleed whites have a little more hand to it than a cotton white so that's the things that you're going to have to deal with and design around and what do you do LP, when you you know you're going to go on a bleeder well for me it's just a uh, it's it's all about mesh right like that's going to dictate what mesh i can use for the base for the mm -hmm. overprints and that's also going to dictate the dot size and kind of the whole approach that I'm going to take when I'm setting it up. Yeah, I would take very much the same approach. Um, depending on how bad the situation is, uh, we would almost always use uh, some sort of a low bleed base, uh, like a barrier, a gray barrier base. Yeah. Um, but then we might actually go to a low temp plastisol. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the other ways aside from just using low bleed inks, but using a low temp plastisol is another way to, um, to mitigate dye migration. Yep, exactly. Um, so the next uh, slide here shows just a, a basic physical product inspection where we would actually be checking measurements. We have an extreme example here. Yeah. Uh, where <laughs> you've got a jersey with a, with a slanted panel going across the front 
in this case, we actually had to print on that panel. So we wanted to take some actual tests. We didn't want to rely specifically on the manufacturer's specs. We wanted to measure it for ourselves. Um, but we would actually be checking all of the, the garment measurements across a full size run, um, because that obviously comes into play when you're sizing your graphics is, you know, would, do we need to resize the graphics for, for different size um, garment sizes? Um, checking um you know the the actual measurements from seam to seam if you're if you got zippers or anything like that um you know a lot of the the design and printing work that i've done um you're doing oversized images printing over seams and off of hems so it's very very important to know exactly what you're dealing with um also just getting doing a tactile test where you're 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 touching the fabric getting an idea of how coarse the fabric may be or how it's, um, you know, maybe going to absorb the ink, um, you know, getting an idea of what the, you know, what you're going to be dealing with in terms of ink penetration, stretching the fabric to know what you're dealing with there. Um, and then uh, actually running a platen test. So we always would want to make sure that the, um, the garment itself, the construction of the garment is what's the largest size platen that we can put that garment on to. Um, without severely warping or stretching the fabric. Very, very important. You know, when you're talking about the stretch test and, and the tactile, and, and this is when you actually sometimes have to go back to the PIB on the ink you're using because you, you're looking at it and you say, oh, well, this ink looks great up for this design. And then say, <laughs> which happens quite often, someone will have a whole run of shirts and they'll throw a handful of these in there. You, you know, you, you pretty much have to tell them, I can't use the same ink. I'm going to have to use this other ink that stretches, and gives with it, and it's going to give a look, different look, different feel, maybe glossier. There's a lot of lot of things that can change about it. But that's when you have to really go back and mm -hmm. find the right product. And if you can't find it online, obviously call your manufacturer, ink manufacturer. There's someone there waiting to talk to you, especially now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So um, if we go to the next slide, um, the next stage here is actually producing digital mockups. So building a realistic digital mockup is absolutely essential to this process. And the components of a digital mockup would be a high resolution image of the base product, the base garment, um, high res or vector graphics, and then um, accurate scale and placement of the graphics onto the, the base product. And that ultimately equals a photorealistic digital mockup. So first we wanna go with how do you procure these, these high resolution um, uh, garment images? So if you go to the next slide here, I've got an example, um, great site called Photific. I don't know if you use them LT, but um, yep. really, really good resource where they've got you know really perfect high resolution crystal clear images of a whole variety of products from manufacturers. In the example here, we've got some Bella Canvas products. Um, and they're they're actually kind of deconstructed so they're layered um where you've actually got you know um a base layer and then a detail layer separate you can insert the graphics under the detail layer and you can actually even get shading to kind of give a more realistic idea of what the graphics are going to look like on the on the product as seen in the example um if we go to the next slide samar another uh, great resource They've got their entire um, product line um, digitized. Uh, so it's you know hundreds of thousands of images. Um, again, high resolution, perfect flat images, great to work with. And then what we would do is um, we would take the either the measurements, the specs uh, from from the Sanmar site um, or from our our in-house measurements. And we can take those those digital images, size them to scale, and um, and then if we're working with our graphics to scale, then everything is going to you know to actually be accurate when you when you compile those together. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, something that we built in house is is our own photo studio. Um, I think it's uh, you're you're always going to be working with new products where maybe you don't have access to high resolution flat images. So as you see here, we created um, actually a fairly inexpensive setup. Um, I would say that uh, you're looking at a, anywhere from a five to $10,000 investment in creating your own photo studio, LED lights, um, digital SLR camera. We actually mount had the, have a camera mounted from the, from the ceiling. 
Um, so a great way to, I mean, you could take, um, you could take a, an apparel piece, drop it on a green screen there, and you can have your own high resolution um, uh, template within 15 minutes. Tom, that was one of my favorite things I saw at your shop last time I visited is when I saw that little studio set up, I'm like, how is this not in every shop? This would be like the most handy thing to have, you know? Yeah. I mean, awesome. we use it, it, we were using it all day, every day. Um, if you go to the next slide here, uh, you'll see an actual example here of, um, of a digital mock-up. So again, taking that high resolution based product template, the scaled uh, vector graphic in this case, LT, you might recognize that image. That's right, <laughs> enjoy the vision. <laughs> um, and then uh, add those together and you've got your photorealistic mock-up, um, even with placement markers there. So you're get, getting an accurate idea of what that, what that product is gonna look like before it's ever even sampled. Which brings us to the next step in the process, pre-production sampling. So in any kind of um, traditional product design, um, you'd have prototyping. So sampling is also a form of prototyping uh, in graphic apparel design. No matter how accurate we are with creating a digital mock-up, it's no substitute for a physical sample. Um, in the sampling stage, this is where we have an opportunity to make adjustments. Um, so you, 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 you run your first sample, you can adjust graphic sizing and placement, ink or thread colors. You can make uh, tweaks and adjustments to separations or digitizing, um, you know, whether it's for, for benefiting the actual quality of the image that you're producing, or if you're making an adjustment that you know is going to ultimately benefit the production run. Um, a, to that point, you could uh, make adjustments to your print order or production sequence if you've got multiple um, steps going into the into decoration steps in the in the finished product. Um, LT, you talked about that a little bit on the last uh, yeah. on the session here. How do you guys? Pre-production samples are kind of again. It's one of those things that it's helped me out so much on a production end of things when either a I'm working with a low quality graphic to show them like, hey, this is you know, not necessarily gonna come out the way you think and trying to explain that to somebody that doesn't really have a grasp on design anyway, um, showing them a physical sample is just the best way to it. A another thing is I'll get a lot of graphics that have bitmapping done to them. Mm -hmm. You know, like your, your standard designer will throw a bitmap into something, but they don't understand what that means, you know, when you're screen printing, right? Like dot size and angles and, so a lot of times I'll get something that has big solid areas and super fine predetermined bitmap half tones. And that's one of those things where it's like, a lot of times designers don't understand or they don't believe you what you're saying. It's like, well, it's gonna close up, there's gonna be dot gain. So being able to push them and lead them to a pre-production sample usually clears all that up, you know? Yeah, it also helps you uh, get rid of a lot of problems you'll have later on the production, obviously. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, like size of the image of each color, sometimes you might want to switch a smaller image before a larger image and, and things like that, especially in water-based printing. You almost always want to put a smaller image first, larger image second. Mm -hmm. And if the separator hasn't, uh, you know, adjusted for that, it could be a problem. Say you have a yeah. small yellow area going and you have it's supposed to go on top of a yellow, a red area you almost have to flip that around to make it easier for production run. Obviously we're here to print t-shirts fast. We're not here to sell art, but we want that art to look most like what we, we designed. And that's the, that's the key. That's the, the split between the, the design and the set, the set and yeah. then uh, the print. Yeah. Big time. Like outside of like taking the guesswork out for the customer, you are also, you have the ability to really streamline it for your own production, right? right? So seeing the inefficiencies of it, things that you couldn't really guess, you know what I mean? Or just things that pop up and being able to handle that and plan for it for the full run is. Or had to, oh, we should have done that. Yeah, right. Have yep. to the run, you know? Yep. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just r removing any kind of doubt for the the customer, um, removing any kind of concerns about subjectivity, because there could be, you know, again, no matter how accurate we are in the proofing process, um, there, you know, when, when you go from a proof to an actual physical product, there could be some, you know, some subjectivity there. Yeah. We don't want to have that. Uh, we already have enough to deal with as decorators. 
we want to eliminate the concerns of yeah. subjectivity from the customer. I mean, Tom, you'll you'll say it. Like I've been doing this 16 years full time, and every week I learn something new or I see something that surprised me. You know, that's part of what's awesome about screen printing. You know, or terrible about it, but <laughs> depends on if you're a glass half yeah. empty kind of guy or half full. You know, but for sure, I, I don't know, man. I always see something new and and learn something all the time doing screen printing. So, you know, the other purpose of a pre-production sample is um, for your production staff, for your production and your PC staff, um, having a tangible piece to match to throughout every part of the process. Therefore, yep. you know, your, your press operators, your line inspectors, your embroidery operators, they're looking at the same finished product that the customer has approved, and it can give them a sense of confidence um, as they, you know, as you go throughout all stages of production, making sure that that we're matching accurately. Now you're hundred percent right on that. I, I go into shops that do not use this system and they'll just print and print through and you'll look at the first print and the last print and they look different. Yep. But if you have a production sample, it's hanging up there in front of her in their face the whole time. And you can see the subtle differences changing, you know, it, cause it's hard to see a change when you're just offloading the oven, you know, it's hard to see that yep. little, little change over time, unless it's absolutely drastic problem. You know, um, that that's one thing I think a, a production sample really, uh, really keeps you your quality up. You know, the other thing that comes up oftentimes, and maybe you can speak to this uh, LT, but who pays for, for a sample? Um, I know, uh, th that's a lot of decorators. When I talk to them about the the importance of sampling, they say my customer won't pay for that. Um, what's what's your stance on on who pays for a pre production sample? Um, well, I mean, it, it really goes to the liability of it, right? So, like, a lot of times the pre production samples that we're doing is because something isn't uh, it, it wasn't done right. You know what I'm saying? Like. Uh, it's one of those things that we flagged on, on whether it's on a sales end or whether it's on a production end, like, Hey, you know, I don't feel confident that we're going to be able to replicate this the way that the customer might think, you know, being able to identify their, your customer's expectations and then just leave them that way. It's like, Hey, you know, like this is a customer that's rejected a job that, you know, you might consider is fine. Like, you know, within the boundaries of a screen printed product and, you know, being able to identify potential issues that your customer might have and leading them to that. Um, but again, there's other projects where let's say you have a run that's a gigantic run, you know, like it's going to be on multiple presses. It's going to be running for days on end. Those are situations where, you know what, it might be best for you to get ahead of it, knowing that your production will be able to run more efficiently by having that pre-production sample, having the, the squeegees that they need, obviously the mesh that, have all your mesh ready to burn it on. And, you know, it just depends on the situation. I, we've done it both ways. Well, we, we would from time to time, a long run like that, but you, you know, you don't have the time to do the pre-production, have the customer on site right when you strike the first yeah. one and gamble because you feel like you're going to hit it. Mm -hmm. You're gambling that they're going to like it and sign off on it. And most of the time it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. And Tom, you, you with that, that photo studio setup, you could easily take that first, you know, shirt off the press and send that photo right to the customer and get them to sign off, you know? And yeah, we actually, um, we actually had that as a service. Uh, we called it an e-press check. So it was, cool. it's, it's clearly not a sample, but on smaller runs um, of, you know, designs that were still high profile, we would often uh, take that first run. We we commit, you know, 15 minutes to a half an hour of press time. We charge the customer accordingly, but we're able to very, very quickly turn around a high resolution photo, get it into our customer's hands. And that gives a very, very good idea to the customer of what the finished product looks like. They can't right. touch it and feel it, but they have a good sense of what it looks like. You better have a good camera too. Yeah. yeah. Or at least look at the picture you took and use some filters to make it look right. 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 <laughs> So I mean, make it look like what's on the press, not look right. You know what I mean? The the other idea of, you know, who pays, you know, when we're talking about larger runs and I'm not, I'm saying anything over a thousand units, um, I, I almost look, like, look at it like it's 
it's to your benefit as as the the operator or shop owner um, to run that sample. And you're going to, you know, kind of refine the, it gives you an opportunity to refine the production process. And you're probably in most cases going to make it up um, on, on the production end to cover the cost. Yeah. Um, you can, at that point, you can make it free to the customer um, and yet build it into the per unit print price. That's another way to handle it. Certain um, printing techniques, uh, we would always just require, we, it was, we stated that to the customer, you have to pay for a pre-production sample. So if you're doing any kind of special effects, um, any type of high density or anything where you actually have to you know, have that um, um, tactile interaction with the finished product, customer has to get it in their hands. So uh, we have a couple of questions. Who do you get to sign off the approval for the art and then for the shirt? I mean, it has to be the customer, doesn't it? I don't. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not sure. I understand the 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 question because we would have multiple in-house sign-offs, and then of course the ultimate approval comes from the customer for yeah. sure. I I think I think so too. Yeah. I think you're gambling if you're going to have a salesman sign it off. That you stop protecting you at all. Yeah. Right. I got a question about the uh, the your mock-ups um, when you create a design and you're putting on the shirt that you're showing, do you adjust anything for opacity and so on where the ink would actually look like? What do you? Yeah, do? I mean, there's, there's uh, LT, you can speak to this. There's countless adjustments yeah. that you can make in Photoshop. And we actually had kind of just created a set of actions that would um, were, you know, for based on different products, whether it, or, you know, or different colors. Um, we had Photoshop actions that, that were built um to accommodate and then maybe you know manual adjustment slight manual adjustment on top of that so there are definitely um adjustments that you can make in photoshop to help you mimic the look of discharge ink um, or plastisol ink or um you know white ink uh or uh sorry printing on a uh, you know lighter substrate versus a darker substrate to ultimately create a pretty accurate version of what that finished product is going to look like I can just say when I'm designing for a process or a simulated process, I'm making those adjustments as I go so I can view it like it really looks like. And and it's been a, from a long time. I, I When I went from one job to another, I would redo this every time. I would have someone print the shirt in each color individually and send it to me, give it to me one at a time. So I'm, I know I'm matching. And I, and I get to a pretty good average uh, under base white, second white that goes on top of it and colors that go on top of that. So you can get very close and that's about you making a decision as, a, as an artist as you're separating. And it helps, it helps it tremendously when it gets out on the press. I don't know if there's any more questions here. Looks like we're, we're in pretty good shape here. We had 28 minutes. Wow, that just flew. Wow. Very quick. Hey guys, I really appreciate you guys being on with us uh, these last three events. Um, I, I hope that everybody will go and, um, and watch these one at a time. We will have this uh, slideshow available to you to, to go through. Um, we'll have Ashley put it on the, on the Poly One website or Poly One, uh, especially Inc.'s uh, Facebook page. Uh, we are also releasing these on the YouTube channel, so look for them there. Uh, I really appreciate you guys doing this. This has been a really, it's been a lot of fun. It's been nice hanging out. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's been awesome. Thanks so much for participating, LT. Ray, thanks so much for having us. Anytime. Thank you, guys. And if we're signing off, we appreciate it. <laughs>